and welcome to another edition of the 66 to 87 podcast. I'm Tom Reed, uh, joined as always by Dave Molinari. A little bit later, we will be joined by the Athletics' Aaron Portsline. We'll be discussing as we continue to go around the Metro Division with uh, team previews. Uh, he'll be talking about the really chaotic uh, offseason of the Columbus Blue Jackets and what we might expect from that team. Uh, but of course, uh, Dave, it, it's October. Uh, we're just a less than two weeks away now from the opening games in 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 um, Tampa and uh, Florida. Really a tough start to their schedule. And you spoke uh, recently here one on one with Brian Burke, president of Hockey Operations, and uh, you had a you had an individual story with Burke talking uh, kind of about the season coming up, and then also in today's uh, Friday Insider, uh, you, you had you quoted him as saying, "Pretty much, uh, while they'll still be looking on the waiver wire, uh, this is pretty much the team that they have right now is pretty much the team we're probably going to see line up on October twelfth down in MLA Arena in in Tampa Bay." And I think uh, that's fine when you're coming off back to back cups or you're you're thinking that there's a there's a really strong chance to maybe win another cup here. But I think fan bases, when they hear that, they think when they hear the phrase, the answer is in the room, uh, there's there's the anxiety level tends to go up when they don't feel that their team is quite up to snuff. Uh, Do do you agree that that there's been this sense of all summer? Okay, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Well, how are they going to add? And they really haven't made any major moves. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they obviously were hamstrung by the uh, the salary cap. You know, they yep. haven't had a whole lot of space to work with. They had to get rid of a guy who could have contributed this coming season in Jared McCann uh, simply to become cap compliant. Um, so, you know, if they, if they would make a move to uh, bring in a player of any consequence to to fill one of the, the holes on their or in their lineup, uh, they would have to lose uh, basically the same amount of salary or more, uh, given that they only have about $120,000 in cap space uh, at the moment, which would probably cover a team meal, but not a whole lot more than that. <laughs> yeah, it almost reminds me of if you, if you look at in the, in the game of chess, they they from a financial standpoint, they feel like I feel like they're in check, not checkmate, but every move they try, they would think about making, they're still back in check because, as you mentioned, it's it, unless the money lines up, uh, it's very hard to to make a deal when you when you, and and, and let, let's let you know let's this is not only a problem in Pittsburgh, this is a problem in a lot of markets. Uh, part of it due to last year not having fans in the building for most of the year. Uh, the, 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 uh, the salary cap has kind of stayed where it is. And it's, it's not good for a team like Pittsburgh trying to make one more run, but there is a player on this roster, Dave, that is kind of intriguing. And to me could be kind of an X factor here. And that's Kasperi Kapanen. Uh, Mike Sullivan over the last couple of days has been asked a lot about Kapanen. Uh, and he's really, uh, pumping, uh, Kapanen's tires. And I don't think it's necessarily, doing it in a way that's uh, disingenuous. I, I, I like Kapanen. I think that if you look at this roster the way it is right now, there are some guys on this team that certainly can get better. I, I especially look at the back end. John Marino, we think there's an upside there. P.O. Joseph, we got a glimpse of him last year. Uh, there, there looks to be an upside there. You go up front, you see Teddy Bluger. And I think there's a little bit of an upside there. But but of all these players that we we're, we've just mentioned, I think Kapanen is a guy that there is more to to give. You see the speed, you see the occasional uh, the the ability to add offense. He's a guy that I th- I think they're really hoping can have a breakout season. Only once in his career has he hit the twenty goal plateau. But he's going to have an opportunity here, especially early in the season, uh, with without Crosby, without Malkin. They need somebody to step up offensively, and to me, this is a great opportunity for him. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you've moved on with the subjects because I am still trying to master checkers, so <laughs> the chess no, parallel to to... completely eludes me. Uh, not to go uh, Queen's Gambit on you. <laughs> uh, 
well, I'll, I can jump in either direction when I double up on my checkers. So, <laughs> uh, uh, no, I think uh, Kapanen, uh, there is some serious untapped or undeveloped uh, potential, especially offensively there. Um, and, you know, in, in one sense, uh, the absence of Crosby and Malkin at the start of the season uh, could lead to him having more opportunities to be involved in the offense. On the other hand, uh, you know, he would benefit from having a, a an elite level centerman uh, giving him the puck. Uh, right now, and this certainly is subject to change before October 12th, but right now it looks like Evan Rodriguez would be his center. Yeah. And, you know, Rodriguez is a perfectly capable, versatile um, NHL forward. But, you know, he, he's not an overly gifted playmaker or anything of that sort. And, you know, uh, Kapanen can only use that really good shot of his uh, if he's able to get possession of the puck. So, you know, in, in some ways how he fares in the early going and really even after, and unless they completely scramble their top six, uh, you know, how, how Jeff Carter would do it, getting him the puck when Crosby returns and Carter drops down to the second line, you know, that that's going to have a big say in uh, how Kapanen's able to produce. What do you think that the, 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 the plans for him are as far as the power play? You, uh, for our listeners that r- will remember last year, we talked to uh, Kasperi's dad, Sammy, who was a very good NHL player in his own right. And he, I, I'm sure you remember him saying that if he were to get significant power play time, he thought he could develop into a 40 goal scorer, which, wow, that, that's saying a lot for a guy who's only hit 20 once. What do you think that maybe he could add to the power play this year? Well, I mean, he's, uh, you know, a, a terrific shot. And, you know, with Crosby and Malkin out at, at the beginning of the season, uh, he certainly seems like a logical candidate to fit in somewhere on the power play, not necessarily in a spot that either of those guys would have occupied. I could see giving him some time in the old Phil Kessel position on, on the left side. Uh, he doesn't have... Kessel's passing ability, but you know if if you can get good puck movement on your power play and set him up for one timers, you know I think he could convert a pretty nice percentage uh, of them. Um, but uh, regard you know, and we we haven't seen uh, their power play really uh, to this point in, in training camp, so we don't know who will be on it, let alone where everyone will be positioned. But you have to think that, that Kapanen is, is a pretty good candidate to uh, be in that mix somewhere. Yeah, for a guy who has spent a, 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 a majority of his young career kind of, I don't want to say buried, but you know, he, he played in Toronto where uh, they do have a somewhat like Pittsburgh, a top-heavy lineup. Uh, where he just was really never given that opportunity to fully shine and then to come here, uh, you know, he did get the chance last year. And again, this guy didn't really have training camp, right? There were, there were issues with, uh, he had some immigration issues, right? As far as getting him here uh, after the deal. Uh, yes. And uh, as I recall, missed a few games at the start of the regular season while those were all being worked out. So yeah, that, that kind of put him behind, um, you know, and, that when you're trying to catch up to the whole league, you know, that, that can be quite a challenge. So this year they uh, very clearly plan to not have, you know, being unprepared for the regular season be an issue uh, for him. Uh, Friday night he was to play in his uh, second of their first two preseason games. Um the obvious objective is to get him in, uh, you know, in fine form for the for the start of the regular season, and that's understandable because on, on a team that could be offensively challenged, he's somebody who could make a positive difference. Yeah, I, I think coming into this season, he's kind of their X factor. If he can make a jump, uh, 
we'll see again. This will all be determined and start to play out on October 12th uh, when the Penguins uh, go down to Tampa and face the two-time defending champs. All right, we're just getting started on the show. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about whether uh, whether it's it's wise over these last couple preseason games to start getting lines that, that, that could play or whether you just continue to move forwards in and out and, and see what, what works. Uh, stick with us here on the 66 to 87 podcast. Welcome back to the 66 to 87 podcast. And Dave, uh, on Friday, uh, as, as always, uh, Mike Sullivan met with the media and you were, I think, the first question. And I thought it was an interesting one, uh, given the sense that this is going to be a year where none of the lines necessarily are what they were at the end of the season because of losing Sidney Crosby, for, at least for a short time, and Evgeny Malkin for several months. It, it would you The way that you posed the question was, would you use – the last couple of preseason games, three or four preseason games, to start to bring you to start to sharpen the focus on the lines. In other words, get these guys ready to go. Kind of how you envision uh, this lineup to look on October twelfth against Tampa Bay. And I thought it was kind of a interesting answer from uh, from from Sullivan in, in his response to you. Uh, what did what for for those who haven't had a chance to hear it? What did he say? Well, um, basically. He said that yes, that he he will try to get uh, the new lines uh, some time together. Uh, in in the preseason games, he didn't guarantee that that would start to happen in, in their next game, which is Sunday at home against Detroit. Uh, but he also uh, made it sound as if that's not a real priority that. Uh, because a lot of these players have familiarity with uh, one another as, as teammates, if not always as line mates, that that will make it easier for them to adjust to uh, and, and adapt uh, to one another's styles and, and the nuances of, of each other's games. And, you know, on some levels that makes sense when you, when you watch a guy play in practice every every day or in in a game uh you do get a feel for what he does but i don't know that that's necessarily the same as uh you know doing it in tandem with with a particular individual or two individuals you know as line mates so um I, I guess, as you could probably tell from my question, I, I thought it should be something of a priority. And uh, as you probably could tell from his response, he doesn't seem to share that perspective. Uh, first, set up what we think were, are going to be the top two lines in your mind. Oh, that would uh, for now be uh, Gensel and Rust flanking Jeff Carter and Jason Zucker and Kasperi Kapanen uh, flanking Evan Rodriguez with, I'm, I'm feeling pretty certain about five of those guys. I, I think Rodriguez as the second line center still is somewhat up in the air, but I think he's a, you know, a, a pretty safe choice for them to go with there because he's, he's experienced, he's responsible. He's not a spectacular talent by any means, but when you're talking about somebody who right now looks as if he would only be a placeholder for a handful of games until Crosby comes back. Um, I, I get the impression that they're leaning in that direction. In your, in, uh, now for, for fans, uh, now, now you, you may not be as good in the, in the world of chess, but you certainly know uh, football, uh, uh, Dave. And uh, in, in the NFL, they, they only have – now I think they only have three preseason games, and they use, usually use the second-to-last one as a kind of a 
quote unquote dress rehearsal where they're playing the regulars in their positions. Of course, in football, you're really only playing one position. But could you would can you imagine like maybe in your mind, would you like to see them play at least two games uh, with, with what we think is going to be their lineup? Maybe the the second to last game and the third to last game, because usually that last game is we, we just don't want anybody hurt and maybe taking a last look at some guys that they may think about keeping. Do you think they need at least, a, in your mind, a, a couple of games to play together, those first couple of lines? Do you mean American football? Uh, yes. Um, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think two or three games uh, would be good. Um, I think teams tend to dress stronger lineups for home games wherever they fall in the preseason schedule. Yeah. And and the Penguins final two games are in Detroit and Columbus respectively. Uh, so we don't know, well, we don't even know what kind of lineup they're going to, to dress on Sunday, let alone, you know, a week from now. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, you know, it's fine that if, if when you've settled on your, your forward combinations that you they get to be together every day in practice. But I just don't think there's there's any way to replicate game conditions, even if they're exhibition game conditions. And I, you know, I think uh, two, three games would would be reasonable to to give guys a, a chance to gel or maybe to. Uh, get a, a convincing indication that they simply aren't going to gel and that you'd better, you know, plan on switching some things up. Um, you know, our, our first segment, we talked about maybe Kapanen being kind of this X factor guy who really could possibly make a jump to be a 20, 25 goal scorer. Uh, and become more of an offensive force. He's, again, we, 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 we mentioned he, he has the tools uh, to do that. Uh, one guy that they thought was going to do that when um, uh, Jimmy Rutherford made the trade uh, was Jason Zucker. And I think he has been one of the real mysteries of this team since he's been here. Uh, again, much like Kapanen, the, 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 these guys, there was a short season last year, of course, uh, 40, 40 some games, uh, came in at the end, the tail end of the year before, um, uh, in the trade with Minnesota, uh, Dave, what do they get? I, 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 I almost know your answer already, but what do they have to do to get this guy back to being a 30 goal scorer or, or do you, or are we starting to think that maybe that was an anomaly that, that season? Um, First of all, if I if I really knew the answer, I wouldn't tell you. I would sell it to the Penguins for a lot of money, because having Jason Zucker produce the way they thought him uh, capable of of doing uh, would be worth a lot of money to them. That would be very valuable. I I mean, when when you look at the components of his game. Uh, you think that no, thirty goals wasn't an, an anomaly. Right. Um, you know he does everything that that you would want to see from a guy. You know to to produce at that level. You know he he's got good offensive skills. He's willing to go to the net. You know he he'll do the hard work. It's I mean it, it really is. Hard to explain, and uh, certainly something that it's offensively been a struggle that I didn't anticipate. It, it, I think it's safe to assume uh, the Penguins didn't when they when they made uh, made that trade because you know they certainly gave up some some pretty good assets uh, in a you know a first round draft choice and a pretty nice defensive prospect in in Kalen Addison uh, to get him. Uh, you know, perhaps this will be his Pittsburgh breakout season, yeah. and it's it certainly would be timely uh, for the franchise if if he would do it at a time when when they'll be without Crosby and, and Malkin at the start. But uh, I, you know, I can't say you that I've seen anything through the early stages of, of camp that suggests you know that uh, such a breakout is imminent. And it's weird too, because, like you said, and, and we've talked about him in the past, and it's it's not like he's dogging it. He plays hard. He gives you good effort every night. Um, 
And yet we've seen this happen in recent years with the Penguins, with some guys that come in. You know, Jeff Carter last year stepped right in and looked like he'd been a Penguin for the last five years. You know, I, I, I think back to Derek Broussard and how much, how much he struggled. Uh, and there have been some other guys that have come here. Now, a couple of the guys like Marlowe were kind of at the end of the run that, that, that didn't necessarily fit in here. Do you think, and I'm sure you've, you guys have asked him this, just maybe pressing a little bit too hard. He, he knows it's in. He knows that's in the game. I, I'm just wondering if the the issue is almost a little bit just between the years. Uh, I I don't know that he's been asked that directly. I certainly don't think he has in training camp because I believe he's only spoken to reporters once so far. They uh, for people who aren't aware, uh, they bring out two or three players after each practice. Um to speak with reporters in, in a group session and uh, they pretty much try to give everybody a shot. So Zucker was uh, one of the early guys who hasn't, he hasn't been back for his second rotation yet. Uh, but no, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, if he's starting to second guess himself a little bit now and, and wonder what it is that, that he's not doing. Uh, I certainly would not, Equate him, and, and you didn't, with, with Derek Broussard, who his issue definitely was between the years. I mean, yeah. he, he, in every conceivable sense, was the ideal guy oh. uh, as a fit for their number three center. Everything oh. about his game, uh, you know, he was perfect for that role. But in his head, he simply could not accept the idea of being a, a number three center. And I'm I'm sorry when when you join a team that has Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin, you must have an awfully inflated opinion of yourself if you think you should be uh, playing ahead of those two guys. So I I think if uh, Broussard had been willing to accept his role here, he would have been a a terrific addition. But, you know, as you noted, he uh, he will instead be a guy forever known uh, for not panning out uh, the way he should have. And, and 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 I am a big Derek Broussard guy from years from years back with the Rangers, and but his career has just, you know, he's never really recovered from that. It 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 it, 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 it is really shocking that there was no real injury, there was no reason why he should not have been able to continue to play and perform at the high level that he put, did with the Rangers, especially in the playoffs. But I I do wonder with getting back to Zucker, if if maybe not having those two high end guys at the beginning almost works more to his favor, takes a little bit of pressure uh, off, I would say off him, uh, and maybe he can just go out and play his game. Because he certainly didn't play with those type of high-end, that high-end talent in Minnesota. No offense to the Wild, but they didn't have anything close to what, what the Penguins have here. No, and again, perhaps the uh, the MVP in waiting this season is Evan Rodriguez, because, <laughs> you know, if he... If he ends up centering for Kapanen and Zucker, you know, the the way their seasons at least start uh, could be determined in, in large part by by how he is able to uh, gel with them. All right. Good stuff. We'll, when we come back, we'll be joined by friend of the podcast, Aaron Portsline. Uh, kind of breaking down of, of, of one of the division rivalries, uh, division rivals, the Columbus Blue Jackets, and just the, the crazy and at times tragic offseason that they have gone through. So stick with us here on the 66 to 87 podcast. Welcome back uh, to the 66 to 87 podcast. And as promised, we are now joined by Aaron Portsline, uh, the terrific writer, reporter for The Athletic, covers the Blue Jackets and all things NHL. Aaron, I think you are now our all-time leader in guest appearances uh, as a friend of the show. This is your third appearance, so you you probably deserve some kind of prize. Does this put me ahead of, is it Brooksy? Yes, you are. You you have surpassed uh, 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 
uh, Larry Brooks, who I think was at two. We had a couple of people on two, but now you are you are the pace car. I mean, I don't really know how to handle that. Um, all I, I'm just going to stay within myself and try to do what I do to be the best me I can be. And I hope that's enough for you guys. Yeah, well, it's preseason, so yeah, that, that's a, how it goes. I had a great summer. I feel like I'm in the best shape of my life. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Let's, let's, let's get started here with you uh, and, and, and the Blue Jackets. You know, the off season uh, kind of began with chaos. Uh, you know, the, the, the thought of, of the, they were probably going to have to move Seth Jones. So there, was the, there was the tragedy over July 4th with the, 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 the fireworks death of the young uh, goaltending prospect. Right. Uh, Aaron, but it seems like over the last month or two, this club has kind of rebounded a little bit with some of the news that's been coming out. Uh, has, has they, is this, what kind of mood is, is this team right now going into the, uh, the start of the season? Yeah. You know what? That's it's, it's been, it's been a long, um, strange and sometimes sad off season for these guys. I mean, you mentioned the the this is a team that came out of last season feeling sorry for itself and wondering where things were going to go. Um, the just the the tragedy of the death of Matisse Kivlaniex, witnessed by goaltending coach Manny Legacy, witnessed by his his good friend uh, Elvis Merzlikens. That r- absolutely, as you as you can imagine, it rocked the the franchise to its foundation. Um, just cast a, a pall and a sadness over things. Matisse Kivleniex, um, we should speak first of him as a person. He was an incredibly joyous young man uh, and sadly stayed behind in the United States, was planning to head home, wanted to witness the 4th of July here. And his the way that his his life ended, the age at which it ended is just, it's, it's, um, it's just so sad and, and, and incomprehensible. Um, and so that I think, I think people started stopped feeling sorry for themselves in a hockey sense. That just really grounded everybody, and I think it brought some people together. Um, they they are going to remember him forever. They're going to remember him through uh, other means throughout this season and beyond in Nationwide Arena on their their jerseys, perhaps. Um, he'll always be with them. But um, it you know speaking to Merzlikens to to uh, legacy, it's still really hard for them, but they seem to be in a good place. And the organization, I think, by all accounts, handled it um, impeccably. Uh, beautiful service. They flew his family here. Um, and the sadness that started the summer, um, I, you know, you can't say they moved on from it, but it galvanized them. It's with them. Um, but but they 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 had uh, to take steps with this team to to fix things. They knew they couldn't keep going down the path that they were on. There is a sense of renewal here, and that's uh, some new veterans and some young players. It's um, they're rebuilding, retooling. Nobody likes to say rebuild because that has negative connotations. And who you know Buffalo scares the hell out of everybody because they've been rebuilding for fifteen years now. Um, so nobody wants to use that word, but they've changed it's upheaval for sure. That the guys that uh this the pillars of this franchise for the last decade plus, Felino, Atkinson, Jones, uh gone, Savard gone. And now it, there's so much opportunity, and that's exciting in training camp. I think it's worrisome when the season starts because they don't have a lot of answers right now in some key spots, but they're young, they're optimistic. They finally have a pipeline of talent that seems very close to the NHL. And it feels like they've taken really positive steps uh, that they needed to take that maybe they should have undertaken earlier. Um, But they're, they're, they've done what they've needed to do. There could be some short-term pain here, I'm not sure what this season is going to look like for them, uh, but I think most agree this is what they needed to do and that they're on the right course. 
Aaron, Aaron, tell us a little bit about some of these young prospects uh, that we've been hearing about. That uh, we see them scoring here in some of the the, the training or the uh, preseason games. Uh, what what uh, what for fans here in Pittsburgh to, to see some of these new names, some of these fresh faces? Tell us a little bit about them. Yeah, well, I think when the Blue Jackets look back on on this this year's draft, the first day, of the Friday. It may go down as one of the bigger nights in franchise history. They had to trade Seth Jones. He was going into the last year of his deal. And, uh, you know, they they ripped the Band-Aid off and traded him to Chicago. It just so happens that these are nights that the Blue Jackets don't have very often where things fall right into place for them. That's not exactly been a, a hallmark of this franchise. It's been quite the opposite, actually. And in that trade with Chicago, they move up from the depths of the first round, a pick they had from Toronto, all the way up to 12. They already own the number five pick. And, at, <clears throat> excuse me, at number five, they they drafted Kent Johnson, who's a, obviously a high-end talent. He's back at Michigan. But at number 12, they landed a player named Cole Sillinger, the son of Mike Sillinger, former Blue Jacket. Uh, we are all officially old, by the way. Um, <laughs> we're two generations of Sillingers now. He... He looks to be a hell of a player. I, I think repeatedly of the comment John Buchagross made, ESPN's John Buchagross, when Sillinger was drafted, he said he was he's born to do it. And the more I get to, to know the kid, the more you're around him, there's just no doubt in my mind that this kid's going to be a hell of an NHL player and have a hell of a long career. I don't know if that starts this year. I think it does. The club has a tough decision there. But Cole Sillinger looks like he's going to be a really, really impactful player for them. The other guy, and this is a this is a great story. Uh, two years ago, you don't see this very often, but two years ago, the Blue Jackets drafted at number twenty-one a player, Yegor Chinikov, that l- quite literally the response by many people who spend months preparing for the draft and analyze every player uh, to the nth degree. The response was, "Who?" You don't hear that in the first round of the NHL draft very often. He was a surprise to a lot of people, not to some other teams, by the way, but to a lot of quote unquote draft draft Knicks. Um, This is not a player they expected to go that early. He was actually eligible to be drafted the previous year and didn't get drafted at all. The next year he goes in the first round. Well, Chinikov's come over and he was just lights out up at the Traverse city prospect tournament, which you, you would kind of hope he would be. Um, that's what first round picks are supposed to do up there, but he's come to NHL camp and that shot still looks pretty, pretty damn impressive. He beat uh, Pittsburgh's Tristan Jari from distance, which you don't see in the NHL very often a clean slapper from above the, the left circle. That was on Monday. The thing they like about this kid, Brad Larson was saying last night, was he plays and he competes without the puck, away from the puck. It's it's not he doesn't have to have the puck on his stick to be an impactful player, and there's still a ton of work to do there, of course. Um, But the the early indications on him are really bright. And one last thing on these two players, they can both go to the American Hockey League. They don't have to go, in Sillinger's case, back to junior. He was drafted out of the USHL where he went to play because of COVID. And because of that, the Blue Jackets can send him to Cleveland. So I think if, if I think you're going to see Sillinger and Chinikov get uh, substantial playing time in Columbus, but they can move these players around a little bit. Um, and Sillinger could even go back for to the World Juniors which is a great, a great experience for a young player. Um, but he looks to be an NHL player. They just have a tough decision to make if that should start this season or if they should punt another year. Aaron, uh, another part of this um, off season that has, has, has seen significant change was is behind the bench. Uh, I think the team and the, and, and, and the coach decided to part ways. John Tortorella uh, out <laughs> after a, the most successful run in franchise history. Uh, he's been replaced by a longtime assistant who I don't, I don't, I'm not sure is that well known to fans outside of Columbus. How is the Brad Larson's transition gone? Yeah, well, it's interesting. This is, this is a guy that the, uh, the response from 
from Blue Jackets fandom when this was announced was, shall we say, underwhelming. Um, well, that's not even the right word. They were pissed. They were pissed off because Brad Larson's been in charge of the power play here the last several years. If you followed the Blue Jackets even a little bit, you know that the power play has just been – it's it rated NC-17, I think, most nights. Like, the kids should not watch this. It was horrifying. Um, but Blue Jackets, I think, are wise enough to realize that, that that's not Larson's only – impact on this organization he was john tortorella's um he was he became john tortorella's mike sullivan if i may um sullivan was was linked tightly to tortorella um in his many stops before columbus when sullivan ended up in pittsburgh larson's much the same way uh highly highly recommended him for the job i think the blue jackets are in a spot now extremely young extremely unsettled if you look at their lineup and 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 larson himself has said this is accurate if you plot out the 12 forwards in the 60s so 18 spots there's one guy who you can say that's his job and that's zach Wierenski, first defensive pairing left side literally everything else is up in the air um again that's a fun and exciting uh, way to look at things in training camp not so fun when the games start to count. It could be a long season, but they need a teacher in that spot. And I think they think Larson is that, a player, a coach who can who can have patience with young players, not a calling card of John Tortorella necessarily. I also think it's key that, that Brad Larson hired a really highly respected assistant coach, Pascal Vincent from uh, Winnipeg. And this is a really... This is a teacher of the game who, by the way, has worked previously with Line, has worked with Ross Levick, two very important players for them. Um, so this is, this is a growth situation in Columbus, and they need a coach. They needed a coach that could, could gel along with that. John Tortorella had no interest in a rebuild. Um, he was leaving. They were fine with that. Time to move on, I think, for both parties. But they think Brad Larson is the right guy for what this team is is facing over the next couple of years. Uh, Poor uh, our, our listeners who pay really close attention to the, the news might have heard of something called COVID-19 over the past year and a half. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, certainly it uh, was responsible for some headlines in Columbus yeah. in the not too distant past with Zach Ronaldo, a uh, player who was consigned to Cleveland because he declined to get the vaccine and uh, assistant coach Sylvain Lafay who lost his job uh, because he didn't want to get the, the vaccine. What was the organization's thinking in that regard? Yeah, well, I, I think, I think privately their thinking is they're, they're just done with some of the ridiculous stuff that's out there. They didn't think Sylvain Lafay, the assistant coach, uh, could do his, his job, Dave. He, I mean, it's a it, the league has mandated that coaches and and staff personnel be be vaccinated. Well, if he can't be behind the bench, he can't be within six feet of the players in the dressing room. He can't fly on the plane with them. Like, what are, what are you doing? What can you possibly do with that? And so they fired him. And they made it clear that they fired him. This was not a mutual parting of ways. This was the get the shot. No, I'm not getting the shot. Well, then get the hell out. We need a coach. And so not the best time, by the way, to be looking for a coach in early September. Uh, so that was the first bit. The Ronaldo, they've taken a really bold stance with Ronaldo. The league has in place, as you guys know, protocols for how to handle players who are not vaccinated and several teams have brought those players uh, to camp and they're prepared to not cross the border with them. I think uh, a couple of teams have said their guys are going to have to mix upwards of 30 games because of the quarantining that would be required uh, to, to go back and forth across the border. The Blue Jackets just told Zach Ronaldo to stay away. Now what, what, 
the early call was to say, you know, you're going to go to camp with Cleveland. I, guys, I'm not even sure he goes there. If he can infect people in Columbus, he can infect people in Cleveland. That's the concern. Um, and so I, that's a story I'm keeping my my eye on here for the next few days when AHL camps start to open. Is Ronaldo there? He won't answer uh, calls or respond to messages. That's fine. That's his right. But I think this is still a story that, that's going to play out. Does he have a grievance against the Blue Jackets? The NHLPA is looking into it. Uh, again, there are protocols in place uh, for such a player. The Blue Jackets have no appetite for that. They were quite proud of the fact that all 67 of their players in camp were are vaccinated. Uh, Ronaldo obviously is not among them. And, you know, I, one thing I think that heightened this is Manny Legacy. We spoke of him earlier. Um, it was on his property that the fireworks tragedy occurred that took the life of Matisse Kivleniak. What a summer he had. In August, he contracted COVID. He was not vaccinated at the time. He was in the hospital for seven days, ICU. I think that rattled them, and maybe even more so than, than they already were. M members of the front office, like all of us, have lost people to COVID. So their, their patience with this sort of thing has worn thin, perhaps thinner than other organizations, and, and they moved quickly and decisively in both fronts. At some point in the future, I'm going to ask you why the Blue Jackets never have a goalie named Ed Smith or Bob Jones. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Elvis Merzlikens just got a, a five-year, $27 million contract, which certainly seems to think uh, suggest that he's going to be the go-to guy there. Uh, do you think that was a wise move? And what does that uh, say about their plans for Eunice Corposalo? Yeah, Dave, do you remember Steve Mason? Mm-hmm. That's, that's the last easy name huh. in Columbus. Um, yeah, look, they, they've hitched their cart to Elvis, and this is, this is great. Tom will tell you. Um, I don't think a lot of guys were, were sure of, of this cat, Elvis Merzlikens, when he got here, like where this was going to go. The talent is there. He is a personality, um, a big personality. I think they have realized um, – that his heart is in the right place, that that his his personality and his antics, if you will, really aren't that outrageous. They're all sort of in the in the in a healthy vein. Um, nothing too showy. They put their arms around him and he, they see the talent there. When the kid gets going, he is an exceptional talent. I shouldn't say kid. He's 27. Um, as for Corpus Allo, look. I, they tried to trade him this summer. The goalie market was flush. It, it's a it's a buyer's market anyways. And then Carolina goes and trades a Calder Trophy finalist for basically a third-round pick and a journeyman. And any hope of trading Corpus Allo for any meaningful pick or player just goes through the floor with a senseless trade like that. And so the Blue Jackets, you know, could they have traded him for a sixth round pick or whatever? Pro sure. Of course they could have. Well, now you need a goalie and you're probably not going to get one, the, the caliber of Corpus Allo for a sixth round pick. So why, why not just keep the two of them together for this year? I still think there's a, a good chance if there are injuries throughout the league at that position, that Corpus Allo gets moved mid season. I don't think he survives the trade deadline. I think that's obvious. Look, the Elvis Merzlikens probably doesn't sign that contract if he thinks Corpus Allo is still going to be around. Nothing personal. He just wants the number one job. And now that Elvis has signed that deal, I don't think Corpus Allo has any interest in sticking around. These guys both want to be number ones. I think uh, Corpus Allo is, is probably traded at some point this season. Uh, if he's not, I think next summer he seeks an opportunity to be a starter for someone. And that will take him somewhere other than Columbus. All right, Aaron, great stuff as always. This is why we always have you on there every couple months. So uh, we'll, we'll send out T-shirts, gift certificates or something to you very soon. I hope Brooks, um, he changes his number. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it uh, this week for us at the 67 for 87 podcast uh, for our guest, Aaron Portsline. Dave Molinari, this is Tom Reed. We'll talk to you next week.